thing many of us are still trying to understand what just happened in Monterey Park over the weekend. The overwhelming amount of grief. I mean, <laughs> here we are again talking about another shooting and it's not even the end of January. So tonight we are not going to talk about the suspected shooter. We're not showing his face or even saying his name. We're not going to speculate his motive because multiple agencies are investigating that and that takes time. It could be days or even weeks before we have an idea of why he did what he did. That and the topic of gun legislation are conversations for another day. Right now, I want to focus on the Monterey Park community because we know that 11 people have died. That number has since gone up since yesterday. One of the 10 people who were wounded died in the hospital just today. We also know that all of those who were killed were 50 and older. That's 11 people who lost their lives, 11 families whose lives are changed forever. So we're gonna take a step back, we're gonna process tonight, and we're gonna take some time to remember those who lost their lives. So this is Mimi Nien. She was just 65 years old. A reporter from our sister station in Dallas is related to Mimi, and this is what she had to say about her. She spent so many years going to the dance studio in Monterey Park on the weekends. It's what she loved to do. If you knew her, you knew her warm smile and kindness was contagious. She was a loving aunt, sister, daughter, and friend. And we've also learned the names of three other victims. Alvaro Valentino was 68 years old. Leland Lee was 63. And Siljoan Yui was 57 years old. Now families are still being notified for the other victims. We will share their stories when we do know more. But Luke Cleary is in Monterey Park City Hall tonight where the community is gathering for a vigil in about a half an hour. Luke, this is a tight community. What have families been telling you? I'll tell you, Alex, people were stunned in the hours after this shooting occurred on what was supposed to be one of the most a joyous nights of the year, the start of Lunar New Year, celebrated by millions of people across the United States, and in particular, celebrated by the predominantly Asian American community that calls Monterey Park home. You know, everywhere you look in this city, there are signs that Monterey Park is a city in mourning. You see the flags flying at half staff. You see the growing memorials uh, from place to place. Just walking down the street, you'll see flowers and tributes and mementos. We've been here since yesterday when the tragedy was still so fresh. But in conversations today, though, I can tell you, we're starting to get a sense of just how resilient this community is. And for instance, today I spent some time with Kerry Gore, who's a third generation Chinese American who has lived in Monterey Park for 60 years, who says her family's not canceling their holiday plans this week in spite of any security concerns. I'm worried. You know, we'll, we'll have it. It's Chinese New Year's. We're going to have our celebration and give out little, you know, lacy and red envelopes and things and family. You know, you need to be together. I'm. I'm going out to see my son and my granddaughter and, and daughter-in-law right now because I need to give everybody a hug. <laughs> yeah, you, you hear it right there. People are finding comfort in one another and in, in family and coming together. We're going to be seeing a lot of that emotion on display here as this candlelight vigil starts in just about a half hour's time, Alex. And I do want to talk about Brandon Shea for a second and he was the one who confronted the gunman in the lobby of that second dance hall and wrestled the gun from him. Talk about brave. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you've been watching ABC Network's uh, coverage of this or ABC 10 in the last couple of hours, this we have exclusive security video, uh, stills from the security video where you actually see him struggling with the gunman to take that gun away from him. People are calling him a hero and crediting him with saving people's lives, uh, other victims that, that could have been killed as a result of this rampage. He spoke, I think, you know, some very profound words of courage and, and what it took in that moment for him to step up. Take a listen to this. Well, a lot of people have been telling me how much courage I had 
to confront a situation like this. But you know what courage is? Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the ability to have adversity to fear when fear, fearful events happen, such as this. And in crises like this, the people need courage, especially the victims, their friends, their families. My heart goes out to everybody involved, especially the people in Stardance Studio and Monterey Park. I hope they could find the courage and the strength to persevere. Hmm. So some powerful words there from a young man that many people are calling a hero, crediting him with potentially saving many more lives. Uh, people are finding strength and comfort in one another and uh, we'll be here for tonight's candlelight vigil. It's just another way that people are expressing their support for one another and finding strength through this tragedy, Alex. All right, Luke, well, thank you. And this moment, of course, weighing heavy on all of us, but especially that of the AAPI community who has faced an increased amount of violence just over the past few years. So I want to go ahead and bring in my colleague Candace Red here because you've been speaking with different members of the AAPI community mm -hmm. who specifically focus on mental health. What have they really shared with you so far? Alex, first of all, this is tough for any community to have to go through, but I want to be intentional and talk about how this is truly impacting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, AAPI communities. And yes, you're right. I spoke with several health experts, um, those also nonprofit organizations, uh, boots on the ground, Who are doing always the work. ready mm -hmm. to do the work every single day. Um, but there's a lot of emotion, raw emotion anger, disbelief, shock, anxiety, disappointment, quite frankly, right? And it's a lot to digest. And health experts, they're reminding people, you don't have to do it alone. You do not have to cope by yourself. And what are some of the tangible, you know, action mm -hmm. items that they can do to even begin to try to cope, heal, like you said, get over that frustration that, where do you start? What are they saying? Well, again, I did speak with several health experts. They're all pretty much so singing the same tune, if you will, the same note here. And they're first saying to talk about it. Um, there's no shame in admitting that you're hurt, that you're disappointed, that maybe you're scared don't know what to do. So talk to a trusted friend, a loved one, a family member. But let's also be clear, some people do not have that. Mm -hmm. So where do they turn? Where do they go? That's where these nonprofit organizations come in at. And if you're not familiar with some of them, then you can also be sure to um, maybe speak with a health provider that you uh, might know of when you go to get certain health, mental health services. And what are some of the challenges for the AAPI community? Oh, because, you know, you do have the boots I on have, the ground. Look, I have my list, Alex. <laughs> I don't <laughs> I mean to cut prepared. you short. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to really, really talk about that as well. Um, this is specifically coming from the American Psychiatric um, Association where they say people in AAPI communities are least likely to seek mental health services than any other race or group. We have to ask ourselves, why is that? And that's because of barriers. That's because of challenges, language barriers. Mm. AAPI people communities, they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. Just like black mm -hmm. people are not all the same. Just like Latinos are not all the same, right? There's a lot of different languages. And then let's talk about maybe people who are within low income communities, um, transportation, yeah. or even just trust. Talking about mental health is taboo within AAPI communities. So there, there also has to be that trust. And then not to also forget to mention representation. People within AAPI communities want to be able to confide and talk to people 
who get it. Mm -hmm. And that is also someone who is a health professional who looks like them, who can speak. matters. The, exactly. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. All right, Candace, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it.